Welcome everybody, I hope you enjoyed lunch. Um, next up we have Eric Anholt, who's going to be telling, telling us about um, Broadcom's open source graphics stack, and Eric was motivated to get into uh, video drivers by um, trying to play Quake on, a, on an unsupported system. So uh, please join me in welcoming Eric. <laughs> Thank you. And we have a display, great. Um, yeah, I'll be talking to you today about Broadcom's uh, VC4 and VC5 open source graphics drivers. Um, I'm going to start with a little note about VC4 because it's kind of confusing. Uh, Video Core 4 is a complete SOC, so it has this little, uh, called the VPU, it's a CPU sitting on the bus. Um, we have open source compilers for it at this point, um, but this is the CPU that comes up when you turn on the machine. Also on this bus is an ARM CPU that you run Linux on, uh, generally. Uh, it has all sorts of peripheral blocks on it. It has clocks and power, it has a video decode and encode engine, it has JPEG decode, it has a camera input, and it also has a GLESS 3D uh, part and a set of display components. Um, when I came into this project, I called my project VC4 because it was for the VC4 architecture, but my VC4 project is just for the 3D and the display. Um, so you'll find some confusion over these terms because I talk about VC4 uh, for doing graphics, which is just these little components down here. You'll find other people refer to the GPU, meaning that VPU component. Um, that gets referred to as the GPU because it has this SIMD engine that you can do graphics-y stuff with it, but you don't use that for doing 3D rendering. Um, so that's just a little uh, heads up about terminology here. Uh, so history of VC4, that graphics component in Linux, um, Raspberry Pi uses the VC4 in all of the versions of Raspberry Pi, um, and they had a closed source graphics stack for it. So the user space on the Linux side would sort of package up OpenGL commands and hand it over to the VPU where there was a closed source OpenGL driver running on that CPU, which would then talk to those uh, 3D and display components. Uh, in February 2014, Broadcom just threw over the wall a BSD licensed OpenGL ES driver for um, another SOC that happened to be very similar. Um, so it had basically the same 3D chip in it. And along with that uh, source code release, they included a 3D hardware spec. So it's about 110 pages um, for this fairly simple hardware that does OpenGL ES 2.0. Um, and I was working at Intel doing graphics drivers there at the time, and I saw this awesome opportunity, right? Uh, Broadcom is getting into open source. So I, uh, hopped on their career site and went looking, trying to find uh, where they were hiring for their open source graphics driver development, and there wasn't anything. So uh, I thought, well, what's the harm? I picked one of their positions and applied with a cover letter saying, hey, instead of the actual position, how about I write you an open source graphics stack? Uh, and Eben at Raspberry Pi replied, I didn't know I could ask for that. Uh, so. I hopped over to Broadcom, started there in June 2014, um, and thanks to the quality of the Mesa stack um, and the kernel display infrastructure, I had a 3D driver up and running, uh, merged to Mesa in August. I had the 3D driver merged to the kernel in October. Uh, so this hardware, the uh, VC4 hardware, it exposes OpenGL ES 2.0. In my driver, I expose both OpenGL ES 2.0 and OpenGL 2.1. The OpenGL 2.1 stuff is kind of a lie because we don't actually support all of the features in OpenGL 2.1. We emulate most of the delta between GLESS 2.0 and 2.1, but we haven't figured out how to do some of the other bits. Or in some cases, we just haven't written the code that we know how to do. Um, the driver supports the Raspberry Pi. Um, as of recently, it also supports Cygnus, which is a slightly later version of the 3D part. Um, I'll talk a bit about that one later. Uh, it doesn't support the Capri, which was the chip that I believe is in most of the Broadcom phones that had graphics in them, um, or that had Broadcom's graphics in them. So 
Uh, that's an unfortunate one in the phone architectures. They had that VPU, of course, doing all of the OpenGL using their existing closed source stack. And so they had no need for the ARM to be able to access the GPU because it's all done from the VPU side. So you actually increase the security of the system, they thought, by hiding all of those registers from the ARM running Linux. So my driver could do this. It would be happy to uh, run 3D commands on the Capri, except I actually just can't touch the registers on it. So you know, unless somebody builds me some little communication channel that could then ask the VPU to write my registers, uh, sorry, I can't do that one. This 3D chip was a little bit of a challenge. Um, the main one is that there is no MMU between the 3D chip and the bus. Um, that VPU that I mentioned sits directly on the bus. That VPU is what runs its OpenGL driver to talk to the hardware. So there was no need for the hardware to have an MMU because if you've compromised the VPU, you've already won. There's no MMU there. So there was no MMU under the 3D driver, under the 3D engine either. Over here in the Linux world, we really want to ensure that somebody that can run graphics commands can't also read Etsy password without the appropriate capabilities. So this was really gross. Um, what I have to do is I look at the, I have the kernel examine the output of the shader compiler and walk through the instructions and figure out, OK, over here I have a texture load, so I'm over here in my command stream, so I'm going to look at the contents of the uniform stream and see what kind of texture it thinks it's reading. Oh, it says it's 1024 by 1024 at four bytes per pixel, so that's this big. And OK, and it points at one of their buffers that they actually control, and it doesn't overflow it. It's horrifying code. Um, it's, it's really upsetting. But this is what we had to do to make sure that we follow Linux's uh, security requirements for graphics drivers. Um, as I mentioned, we're missing compatibility features for OpenGL 2.1. We emulate some of them. We turn, we, you know, if you hand us OpenGL quads, we break that in, down into two triangles on the CPU side and ask you to render triangles instead. Um, on the other hand, there's some, you know, stuff for like 3D modeling software in desktop OpenGL that we can't do in OpenGL ES, and it's not obvious how we would do that. Um, also, because it's OpenGL ES hardware, um, sort of back when OpenGL ES is being designed, everybody that was writing shaders made sure that any for loops in their shaders could be unrolled because it was so slow if your loop didn't get unrolled. Given that everybody is requiring that their compilers unroll all of their loops, the OpenGL ES designers decided, OK, we'll just require that any loop that anybody hands us be able to be unrolled, and then Hardware doesn't require looping support. So a lot of chips of the day couldn't do control flow. Everything was just conditional assignments to do any if-then statements. And you unroll all of your loops and flatten everything to just straight line code. Uh, it's really nice. You, know, you can implement that straight line code very quickly uh, in your sort of in-order processors. Um, on the other hand, people actually want to have loops with variable termination points. Um, the VC4 hardware actually has support for flow control in their shaders. Unfortunately, we don't have quite enough information to implement this totally correctly um, in the general case. So I support loops, but if you do your loops exactly wrong, then we might GPU hang, and I need to go fix that. Um, the other trick, uh, if you were running a shader back in the old OpenGL ES 2.0 days, your shader only has access to output one value to its pixel. It doesn't get to read and write general memory. You can read textures, and you output one pixel. So if that's all that your hardware can support, what happens when you want a register spill? You know, if your shader is sufficiently complicated, I have 69 registers or whatever. If you have 70 values, I need to put one of the values somewhere. Uh, in a normal compiler, you would just spill that out onto the stack somewhere. And on VC4, I tell you, sorry, uh, I can't run that one. Um, this is not technically conformant, but lots of people shipped hardware with this limitation that's not technically conformant. And so 
the answer is that you just make sure that your compiler is good enough that it will run all of the shaders anyway. Um, just figure out how to sort the instructions so that you never have more than 69 values and call that good enough. Um, it also had some very strange register banks. Um, due to some details of the hardware, there's an A register file and a B register file, and you can only read one A and one B per instruction, uh, which there is research for how to support that, but we also have these five accumulators that are very fast that you want to be using as much as possible, and that breaks the assumptions of the research on how to support register banks. So uh, that's super gross. There's no good solution that I've found yet. Um, we have a little bit of overhead due to uh, supporting spilling between register blanks that we really shouldn't have to do. That said, uh, here we are after three years of development, uh, performance of a very popular, not terribly good, but very popular benchmark uh, between the closed source and the open source stack on a Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, those look the same, they're not actually the same. Uh, the open source driver is 0.85% slower on this sample. Uh, we also just recently got access to our performance counters, thanks to some work from Boris at Free Electrons. And so we'll be able to actually go tune this workload now, and I'm very confident that we'll be able to beat the closed source driver on it. So that's a closed source popular industry test suite. Um, I also managed to port an open source test suite over to this platform. So here is a set of relative performance. So that bottom horizontal line is you know, equivalent performance between the two drivers. Um, and the open source driver is looking really good. Uh, I've done a little bit of tuning on this, but not a whole lot. The numbers before I started tuning were still quite good. Um, so interesting on here, this left side of the graph uh, those really big wins are in uh, buffer uploads. So a lot of benchmarks will have fixed workloads, right? You're, you're running this scene that you've computed ahead of time as fast as you can. It turns out that in real world applications like, I don't know, your web browser, you're uploading a lot of data. So given that we're running everything on the ARM instead of shipping our data across to the VPU, uh, we get some pretty big wins from the open source graphics stack on Linux. Uh, the next sort of set of um, good wins are uh, in our compiler generally doing better at complicated shaders. There's the next series is sort of, yeah, our texturing performance is basically equivalent, maybe slightly better. There's some gaps on the right side, which is that the closed source driver can't do loops and control flow that we do in the open source driver, and so I just don't have numbers for those because the other driver can't run them at all. Um, finally, there is one significant loss where we emit sig significantly worse code than the closed source driver um, in a case where both are emitting such terrible code that you're getting two or four FPS. Um, basically, both of us are failing at this test case. So I did all this work on 3D. I love working on 3D. It is so much fun. You get to do all this compiler tuning. It's wonderful. You know, I had results within a few months, and I thought, yeah, I'm going to switch Raspbian over to this. It's going to be great. Um, most of the work in building a Linux graphics stack is not in your 3D driver, which is a lot of work and a ton of fun. It's actually in display. Um, so that's been a lot of the last couple of years of development in this project, is trying to get all of the display components working as well as they did in the closed source stack. So. Um, we have now fairly complete HDMI support. Um, I'm going to have a bunch of little pictures of Adafruit devices because this is the Raspberry Pi, and while a bunch of people connect them to TVs, a bunch of the other use cases are connecting them to little tiny panels. So you'll see a bunch of little tiny panels here. Uh, if you do connect to a desktop TV, uh, we do have HDMI audio support um, as of this last year. Uh, that was work that I had started and was finished by Boris. Um, we as of recently have CEC support. Um, CEC is this HDMI standard that is how when you press a button on your remote control that goes to the TV, your computer can, enter, can get that as input and then you know, do things in its UI based on you pressing left and right on your remote control. It also has input the other way so that your computer can say, oh, hey, I'm turning on again. Maybe you could turn on the TV. Um, 
This code actually was um, Hans at Cisco, had been doing CEC drivers and hit me up and said, hey, you know, I was wondering if you were interested in doing the CEC stuff. And I said, I mean, abstractly, yeah, it would be great if we had CEC support, but um, I tell you what, I could publish the set of registers and maybe somebody else could do it. And so I pub published the set of registers and a couple of months later, Hans had CEC working on the Raspberry Pi. So this gives us a standard kernel interface to this sort of esoteric bit of input um, that in the past has been implemented up in user space. There, there was a libcec library that would talk to all the different closed source vendor ways to do CEC. We now have a generic kernel interface for doing so. Uh, finally, for HDMI, I do power management. Uh, the closed source firmware, when you ask it to turn off the screen, it starts scanning out black. So as far as your monitor is concerned, it's still getting pixels. The pixels all just happen to be black. Um, I actually ask the monitor to please turn itself off and actually power down the HDMI core and all of that. So hopefully, you know, part of my hope here is that we end up with a lower power implementation of graphics as well. If you're not doing HDMI, you can do something much older. Uh, we have composite video out. Um, so on the older Raspberry Pis, there's an RCA jack. On the newer ones, there's a TRRS uh, sort of you know, microphone style jack. Um, so you can get little TV attached things so you can get another display on your board if you're already using your HDMI. Um, and if you don't care too much about being able to read your text because PAL and NTSC are terrible. Uh, more common for little panels is DPI. So this is, um, you have all the pins on the Raspberry Pi are sort of outputting R, G, and B bits um, simultaneously on a clock. So you'll have 24 bits in parallel being clocked out. It's terribly noisy. Um, it takes up your whole header, basically, as you can see. Um, that said, DPI means that you can attach all sorts of little panels you can find on Alibaba. Um, so this is pretty cool for people that are doing hobbyist projects of, yeah, I'll just go you know, get some panel and tell Linux, oh, hey, I have you know, this size of panel. It needs these timings. And you can just go. Um, so it's very fun to do for VC4 because uh, configuring DPI is a single register write for the display. It's the easiest display I've ever worked with. DSI is the most complicated display I've ever worked with. Uh, because I haven't worked on DisplayPort yet. So, <laughs> so in DSi, we've got this little DSi connector on the board. You can see I'm showing the back side of the board because I don't really care about what's being displayed. Uh, I care about the connectors. So uh, the panel is getting power from the board over those two wires, and then there's a 15-wire connection that gives you I squared C and this DSi interface to the panel. Um, this took probably a year, year and a half of work off and on to get our DSi to work. Um, I unfortunately don't have any test equipment. And so DSi was a lot of, you know, write some codes, look at black, write some code, see black, write some code, see black, write some code, see white. Write some code and see black again. Um, yeah, so I finally have an upstream Linux kernel driver for this panel. Um, the panel is a very strange combination. There's a bridge that goes from DSi to DPI, and there is also a microcontroller on the side that does some power sequencing for it, but the communication lines to it are not super reliable, and it, it's all a mess. It, it basically works upstream now. Unfortunately, um, because upstream Linux relies on device tree uh, for ARM having an accurate view of the hardware, as an end user, you have this unfortunate case where um, I have a Raspberry Pi, which has a device tree, and I have a panel. And if I attach the panel to the Raspberry Pi, who should make my device tree be different? Right? The usual solution to these sorts of problems is that your firmware provides a device tree to the kernel, and the firmware will have some you know, arbitrary code that goes and pokes the I squared C lines and checks if it's there, and then modifies the device tree appropriately. And so Linux doesn't have to have the probing code because that shouldn't be Linux's job for some reason. I don't understand the logic here. Um, so the state of our code upstream is that uh, if you add the device tree bits, then your panel will light up. 
But if you add the device tree bits and you don't have a panel present, then the driver won't load because it's waiting for the panel to probe because the panel's an I2C driver, but it's not on your I, actually attached to your I2C. Um, yeah, we're still working on panels. So all of these display outputs are fed by this um, hardware video scaler, I think is the name of it, the HVS. Um, this is what takes a bunch of pixels in memory in various formats and composites them together to a final output image. Um, Raspberry Pi has some of the coolest uh, display compositing hardware I've ever seen. Instead of, most people will have one, two, or three com compositing planes. One of them is a little cursor image, right? So you can just move the cursor image across your desktop without having to actually edit the pixels of your desktop to display it. Um, on Raspberry Pi, the, you have a chunk of RAM in which you put little descriptions of, you know, take this image from here and display it, and then take this image from here and display it on top of their alpha blended, and take this image from here and display it with no alpha blending, take this image from here and do YUV color space conversion and scaling because it's a video. Um, very cool stuff. And the Linux uh, DRM Atomic code has support for these display planes. So user space can ask the kernel to please configure Raspberry Pi's display planes to whatever, whatever setup it wants. Um, there's a little unfortunate piece that the DRM expects that you have a fixed number of these because everybody else's hardware is, has a fixed number. Um, I have eight kilobytes of RAM and the smallest of these is like, what, 12 times four bytes? So I could have a lot of display planes, but I don't think I want to expose, you know, almost a thousand display planes up to user space. They probably aren't going to do anything useful with it. So for now, I expose eight, and you know maybe someday somebody will say, "Hey, I really need 16 or something." Um, I also had a little side adventure uh, for the Broadcom Cygnus platform I mentioned in the 3D stuff. Um, I, you know, got contact with somebody from another hardware group at Broadcom that was doing the Cygnus platform. They have an enterprise phone, you know, one of these VoIP phones with a handset and a little LCD display so you can scroll through your contact list. Um, and it has the VC4 3D in it. This particular platform didn't have the rest of those display components. It had our VC4 3D and it had the ARM PL111 display module. Oh, how do I get this to work? Uh, there was an FB drive driver for the display hardware, so I didn't have to do any new work. Um, I took the FB dev driver, ported it over to the DRM. In DRM, we have the ability to share buffers between different DRM drivers using the standard DMA buff infrastructure. Um, then I built up in user space a little PL111 OpenGL driver. So when Xorg, Wayland, whoever comes along and says, hey, I've got this PL111 display, can I do OpenGL to it? Makes it opens this PL111 driver, which is a tiny, tiny little stub that goes and checks, do we have a VC4 in the platform? Yeah? Great. I'll open VC4 and ask it to do 3D, and whenever I need to display a buffer, I'll use DMA buff to bounce that buffer over to the PL111. Um, this stuff was originally written by the Vivante folks, who um, those developers are working on the 3D part. The 3D part is very separate from their display parts, and you get all sorts of different display parts attached to it. And so they had to already deal with this problem. So I took their same ideas of how to do this buffer sharing and you know, knocked out a Mesa driver so that now this platform looks like a very normal Linux desktop, despite the fact that you have these two separate graphics parts. Um, in terms of other display outputs not previously mentioned. Um, there's been a bunch of work by uh, Noralf Tronis uh, to do support for dis SPI panels. Uh, there, like there are for D DPI panels, there are a lot of little tiny, tiny panels. You know, a lot of them are 320 by 240 um, that you can attach over the SPI bus. Uh, the, those panels are all command modes. So you sort of say, hey, I'd like to display a new image. Here come some pixels, 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 and you drive it with the CPU. Um, so this is not Broadcom related at all. You can attach these to anybody's spy bus. Uh, Noroff wrote a little tiny DRM driver for these tiny displays that supports you know, doing all of the format conversions necessary to display on them. 
So given that people want to attach these to Raspberry Pi, and today, you know, they attach to Raspberry Pi, they get FBDEV, and then you sort of do software rasterization to them. Could we build a VC4 and tiny DRM render-only driver just like I did for PL111? Wouldn't it be cool to have an accelerated X desktop on your tiny little spy display? Um, so I could have VC4 sort of do the compositing, output its composited stuff to memory because it has support for this, and then tiny DRM would need to read those values out with the CPU. Um, one of the big problems in graphics in general across all platforms is that reading values back out with the CPU is very, very slow. Um, like, you know, 10 to 50 megabytes a second kind of slow. Really, really slow. If you can do anything to avoid read back, avoid it. So the next step would be, there's a neat little bit of hardware in VC4. The compositor, instead of outputting memory, can output to a little FIFO in its output, and you can attach the generic DMA engine to the FIFO and DMA from the HVS into the SPI controller without actually hitting memory with your DMA at all. Um, this would be really cool, a ton of fun. I wish somebody would do it because I don't have the time to, but it would be such a neat project. So future work that I'm thinking about for display, uh, we need to get X11 to actually use planes. Uh, right now, it uses the cursor plane, it uses the you know, a primary, primary plane. There's no real primary because I just have a set of structures. Um, but wouldn't it be cool if when your OpenGL says EGL swap buffers, um, instead of actually copying bits into memory where they go on your screen, it would just ask the HVS, hey, could you put the new buffer here um, without actually doing any copies? Uh, another big one we need to support the sand modifier. The, the video decode outputs in a specific, you know, tiling format that is 256 bytes wide columns. Um, everybody's video decode and encode hardware will have some sort of custom tiling format. Everybody's 3D hardware has custom tiling format. So we just need to do Broadcom's custom tiling format as input to our display so that you don't need to have some component of the system go take those columns and turn them into normal uh, raster order RGB. Um, this is going to be a fairly small bit of work, but we don't have test images to test with, so it hasn't been done. Uh, we need to do rotation. So that DSI panel that I mentioned earlier, that, uh, that was the official you know, sort of Raspberry Pi Foundation DSI panel. Um, panels have a preferred orientation. The screen will look brighter from one angle than another. Uh, unfortunately, in the Raspberry Pi case, the most popular display mounts for it due to the orientation of the connectors on the panel will mount the panel upside down. So it sits on your desk and you, know, you boot Linux and Linux is upside down. Uh, that's somewhat unfortunate, you know, even if it's not the preferred orientation of the hardware. Uh, if the user has oriented it the other way, it would be nice if we could you know, display the text right side up. Uh, so we need to do rotation support. Um, Somebody at Red Hat has been doing, uh, Hans de Good has been doing a bunch of work on supporting rotation stuff at boot time for some Intel tablets. So we have some stuff to inherit from there for how to actually expose this to users. I mentioned the issue with probing our panel. Um, the write back connector is that ability to output to memory. Um, Boris wrote a bunch of code for us to expose that uh, using some core code from an ARM developer. So we have this idea of how to expose the ability to write your composited display to memory in the DRM. The code is all written. Uh, DRM has the requirement that in order to land new interfaces for it, you need to have a full user space consumer of it. Not just test cases, but actually like somebody wants this feature. We, we as hardware people all want this feature to be exposed. It's an awesome feature because it means that you get the same compositing when you need to fall back because you have too many planes in your system um, as you would if you were displaying normally. It would be great. Nobody's written that yet. So the patches are all sitting on the mailing list. Uh, they're all reviewed. They're ready to go except that somebody needs to write some user space. Uh, and finally, the reason you would uh, use that hardware 
is that there are limits to your ability to composite surfaces, right? The compositor is running at some clock rate. It can only composite so many pixels per second. And so I need to do calculations in VC4 to say, OK, well, you know, this is an opaque surface, so I can read from this at this rate, and this is transparent, so now I need to read from two buffers and all of these sorts of things. We need to be able to tell user space, hey, this configuration is actually too complicated. I won't be able to scan this out without dropping some pixels. Um, it's just some fiddly math. We need to go and do that. Um, that said, we've got a lot of display support at this point. Things are looking pretty good. Um, and not all of these issues are supported well in the closed source stack either. So where are we at in getting this into users' hands? Um, I want to highlight the Fedora support for Raspberry Pi. Um, I've worked with a couple of their developers on polishing some of this. Um, as of Fedora 26, I want to say, maybe it was 27, I think 26, they support Raspberry Pi 2 and 3 with the full standard GNOME shell desktop um, using the open source graphics stack, display and 3D. Uh, Fedora doesn't have support, however, for Raspberry Pi 0 and 1. Um, that's because they have an older ARM CPU attached to them, which Fedora doesn't build for. And yeah, so you don't get to run Fedora on especially the smaller Raspberry Pis, the Pi Zero, um, that people are putting into little tiny embedded projects. Uh, Fedora can't do those just because it doesn't build for that CPU. Everything else would be in place. Raspbian is the Raspberry Pi Foundation's distribution derived from Debian. Um, they give their users all the options currently. So they have their existing closed source GLES and display stack. Um, it uses FBDev, and then if you ask it to do 3D, it uses one of those display planes to just paste the 3D on top of the screen. So you can drag a window around and try and drag it over your Minecraft, and Minecraft just keeps winning. Um, so the first idea I had for how to support things was, OK, we'll use the closed source display stack still and VC4 3D. So I'll um, do VC4 3D, paint it into a buffer, and then ask the existing display stack to put that on the screen. Uh, it means that you still don't get um, mode setting in X11. right? You can't use XRander because the closed source display stack doesn't really do XRander. Um, it's, it's fairly limited. On the other hand, it means that you get the same set of bugs as you've always had. Um, and some other little details keep working. Uh, they do a lot of user configuration with config.txt in the boot directory, which is just some custom config file where you get to say things like, please set your HDMI boost value to 3 because reasons. I don't know. <laughs> um, there's all sorts of tunable knobs in there, some more useful than others, but people have a lot of these tunable knob set, and so it's a hard sell to say, yeah, everybody's custom configuration, we're just throwing that away. Uh, don't really have a good solution for this other than using the existing display stack. But really my goal is to do a full open source display stack. Um, one of the reasons for that is that we could eliminate almost all of the closed source firmware blob. Um, the VPU is running this you know, little operating system. It's the thing that spins up your ARM running Linux later. Um, and that operating system has, you know, SD card drivers and power management and a display stack and a 3D driver and uh, video decode drivers and all of these sorts of things. If we got rid of display out of that stack, a whole bunch of other things could fall out and you could potentially build a much smaller blob. Um, possibly even small enough that somebody might be able to open source uh, some version of it. I don't know for sure. Um, and there are no promises here, but that's my personal goal, um, would be to get uh, all of the display moved out into open source Linux. Uh, to get to that point, we still need to finish a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, HDMI isn't quite reliable enough. Uh, it turns out that since we power the display off and on a lot more than the firmware ever does, we found a bunch of issues trying to get that to work. Um, we need the input driver for that DSi panel. That panel I showed is a touch screen. If you don't have the ability to touch your touch screen, people get upset. Um, we need support for a lot more DPI panels and the overlays to attach them in the device tree. Um, 
those would be fun little projects for somebody. Just like get one of these panels off Alibaba, figure out how to write a panel simple driver. Um, yeah, that would be a pretty great little you know, intro to Linux display. So Debian, which Raspbian is derived from, uh, their kernel and user face have VC4 support by default, right? It's just upstream Linux. My stuff is in upstream Mesa and Linux, so Debian, of course, has VC4 support. They don't have an official installer for Raspberry Pi, though, um, because the firmware requires that your partitions be laid out, you know, with a little fat partition to boot from, and it has a bunch of files in the fat partition, and updating your kernel needs to go on the fat partition, and it's all very hard, so it hasn't been done in the official installer. Uh, there are some unofficial images that have uh, Raspberry Pi's bootloader attached to them. Unfortunately, I think most people that do unofficial images include the closed source display stack. So uh, I'm sorry to say I don't have a good solution for people wanting to run Debian with VC4 other than sort of rolling it yourself. Uh, finally, other distributions. As far as I know, uh, everybody else basically uses a closed source OpenGL ES and display stacks. Um, I would be quite happy to you know, work with anybody from another distribution on helping get VC4 into their distribution. Um, I would love to see Linux, you know, the other Linux distributions move toward open source display as the default. Finally, um, Android is a distribution, I guess? I don't know. Um, the big problem for VC4 Android, that is to say Raspberry Pi support, is that Android doesn't accept upstream contributions. Uh, you can't put your platform into AOSP unless Google wants your platform, and they don't. Uh, so there is a tree. Uh, Peter Yoon, uh, payo-hd is his GitHub username, has ported Android to VC4. Um, I think it works fairly well. I haven't really tested it myself. Uh, I've had a terrible time building Android and don't really want to go back. Uh, <laughs> the primary problem for VC4 Android uh, currently is that we don't have the external fencing support. So the DRM hardware composer that does all of this fancy display plane stuff we'd like to be using requires for that that you be able to have OpenGL pass an object to the display that says, don't display my thing until the OpenGL has completed. And similarly, it passes out from display when that buffer is now free, and so you can have your rendering block on when the display is ready to be reused. Um, this is not going to be that much code. It is that much testing, because these things are always really hard to test, because fencing support is about synchronization, and if your test doesn't go fast enough, you won't actually ca catch your bugs. So nobody's written good tests for this that I know of yet, and so we haven't done the uh, external fencing support for VC4. So that's all Raspberry Pi stuff, VC4. Um, over the last year, I got to start working on the next bit of hardware. Uh, so VC5, uh, VC5 and VC6, actually, um, is the follow-on to the 3D part that was in VC4. So you take that 3D part out of VC4, just the 3D, not the display and all the other parts, and they kept developing it. Um, so upstream in Mesa today, I have support for two different versions of this, uh, V3D 3.3 and 4.1. These are for set-top box platforms, things that attach to TVs. Um, so this hardware is targeting OpenGL ES 3.1 and 3.2. Uh, 3.2 is current, so this is you know modern, embedded GL hardware, uh, and they're trying to target Vulkan as well. Um, I know they have conformance on the closed source side for GLES 3.1. Uh, I don't know for 3.2 yet, but you know that's what we're targeting. Uh, similarly, I can't say that I actually have OpenGL ES support in Mesa because I haven't passed all of the conformance tests. That's the requirement for using that mark. Uh, the really exciting part of VC5 is there's an MMU finally. It's an optional MMU because the set-top box team is used to having direct access to the hardware and you know, MMU adds latency and who would want that? Uh, but there is a little MMU on there that I get to use, so I no longer need to have contiguous physical memory in Linux. 
Uh, for anyone that has done contiguous memory allocation in Linux, it is very hard. It often says no. Even if it says yes, it takes forever for it to say yes. So having an MMU means I get to allocate pages just like anybody else and attach them to 3D. Um, the shader instruction set has also improved massively. There's no more register banks. Uh, some of the delays have been removed. It's just a delight to work on. Um, also, instead of 32-bit floats, we now have 16-bit floats available, so you can do shader math much faster. Uh, OpenGL ES 2.0 exposed the idea of 16-bit floats, and we just didn't have them. So that, all of that potential performance uh, was left on the floor. So the new VC5 kernel interface. Um, I wanted to build in using the MMU from the very beginning. Um, back on my work on Intel and my work in, on VC4, you couldn't guarantee that somebody would get to use the same offset for their buffer. Um, in the Intel case, it was because displays get pinned at a certain offset in the GPU's address space, and your user space doesn't know where somebody else is going to pin a display in. Uh, for VC4, that was because CMA allocations don't get to take up very much memory, and I wanted to guarantee that I would be able to page things out of CMA and back in if you needed to. Uh, on VC5, I have an MMU, so I decided that every client gets its own address space. It gets the offset to its buffers, that where those buffers will live in its address space, and it gets to rely on those forever. So where before, on Intel and VC4, my command list to the kernel would need to say, hey, uh, over here in memory, have a reference to this buffer at this offset. And over here in memory, have a buffer to have a reference to this buffer at this offset. And the kernel had to do a bunch of computation at draw time to fix up all of the addresses. If the addresses are stable for the lifetime of your client, then you can just write the values in. And all you have to tell the kernel is, hey, please make sure that all of my buffers are in the MMU still. So you haven't paged any of them out. Um, unfortunately, the page table is single level, so I need a four megabyte contiguous allocation to support a four gigabyte address space. I could potentially resize this buffer as you start you know, increasing your usage of the page tables. For now, I'm allocating a single four megabyte page table between all clients. So everybody lives in the same address space, but my guarantee is that you get to rely on your offsets forever. Um, if someday we live in a world where multiple clients need separate address spaces, each with you know, adding up to more than four gigabytes, uh, but each of those clients is still under the four gigabyte limit, then I could potentially allocate another page table and swap between them, but that's a problem for the future. Uh, my ABI won't stop us from doing that. Uh, the way that we get to successfully do a shared contiguous page table is that there's a separate little buffer that is effect effectively page protection bits uh, that lives before you get to the MMU. So I can easily swap in, for this client, you get to look at these buffers, and for this client, you get to look at these buffers. And every time you switch between clients, I just reload that little eight kilobytes, which is fairly cheap, as opposed to having to rewrite the entire four megabyte page table. So this code is currently on my GitHub. It is not on the DRI develop mailing list uh, because the ABI is currently unstable. Um, I need to add that explicit fencing support for, that I mentioned for Android. Um, this is, explicit fencing is also required by Vulkan, which I'm very interested in. So I definitely want to get that sorted out before we settle on our ABI. Pardon. I also need to add support for the texture upload and download unit. So where in the past I had to do a bunch of texture tiling computation on the CPU, uh, on the new hardware we have a little piece off to the side that will take a texture from memory and turn it into the magic you know, vendor specific format for doing 3D to it. Also that part I mentioned where the GMP does this page protection for you, I haven't actually done that yet. Uh, that's just the goal and I need to actually write that code out. So driver status. Um, 
I have a gallium driver in the Mesa tree for VC5. Again, the ABI is unstable, so it's disabled by default. You can't actually build it unless you have a little patch that forces it on. Um, I'm reusing Intel's Gen XML code. So uh, this is, you type out an XML description of the state of the hardware. Um, are we at, out of time? Oh no, out of time, okay. Uh, upstream OpenGL ES driver, we're really close. Um, Vulkan driver is in my GitHub. It is not very close, but it is not that far off either. Um, if I may, how long are we out of time? Stop. No! <laughs> okay, I'll be demoing out at the tables out there. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next talk in 10 minutes.